Hey everyone, this is Clay, producer of Outrage and Optimism. Before we start the show, we need your help with something. We're launching a new website for Outrage and Optimism soon, which we'll talk about closer to launch. And on the new site, there will be a section where our host, Paul, can share ideas, analysis, and, you know, maybe like a song or two. And right before we recorded this episode, it came up that there is no name for Paul's you know, section of the website. So I recorded our impromptu brainstorm session that begins with Paul bringing it up. I'm going to play for you that recording to kind of hear where our heads are at. And then I'll meet you right after to tell you what to do. Here we go. I don't think there's anything wrong with us talking about this on the podcast towards the end if we think we've got time. Talking about what? Naming. What to name my corner. His corner of the new Outrage and Optimism website coming soon. (laughs) I think you just named it your corner. So that's that's like with the crew of of the stage. You know what I mean? That's it's my corner. But then when we're in front of the listeners, could be a magical kingdom. Could be uh, what 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 was the other thing you called it, Christiana? Treasure treasure chest, which ah. I quite like actually. You know, or Easter egg hunt. How about that? Well, that's bordering into you know uh, you know rabbits. Uh, no, I don't. Think so. aren't, aren't rabbits part of a magical kingdom where there would be magicians? Like aren't magicians and rabbits like synonymous with out of the hat comes yeah. insight do we get a picture of you in a magician's outfit above the magical corner <laughs> here's my stick yeah. yeah no i definitely want a photo like a very um wizardy photo you know like possibly with a wizard hat i could even go to one of those shops to see if i can get a wizard hat yeah i have an image of it in blue to be honest with you with gold things you know like gold moons and stars Shall we press on? Uh, we could, uh, but before <laughs> we press on, we'll have to press record. Yeah, I, I'm way ahead of you there, fully recording already. I'm, I have pressed record. How about that? Oh, well, I can forbid people to record as well. The power. Does it, it doesn't use the word forbid on the, it on does. the drop down menu. It says forbid record. I'm going to forbid. So, I'll forbid so you to record. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to record. <laughs> forbid away. Paul Dickinson's forbidden corner. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Does it send marketing. the wrong impression? Yeah. When yeah. you're marketing like things to download, I don't, I, I, it may increase it may, uh, yeah. downloads, but from the wrong kinds you, of people. You may not get the right. <laughs> so that's the way I'm looking at it. You know what I mean? So just keep it cool. Tre- treasure chest is good. Magic is good. Corner is questionable. Uh, what, was the, what was the secret? No. We don't, we don't. Okay, yeah. So that was constructive, I think. We definitely need your help. If you have a suggestion for Paul's new webpage section, corner, magical kingdom, something, tweet at us at Global Optimism or email us at podcast at globaloptimism.com. We are taking all suggestions, forbidden or not. Okay. Thank you for your help. Here's the show. Welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivik Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we speak about the G7 commitment to stop financing coal. We speak to Jerome Foster, the youngest serving member of the Environmental Justice Advisory Council at the White House. And we have music from Alfred Nomad. Thanks for being here. Every week we do these podcasts, we have this amazing climate news that is happening. I mean, the pace and scale of these things, the transformative. I mean, sometimes it's possible to kind of question, is the world really changing at the speed we want it to? And of course, like everything in climate, it's sort of fast and transformative, but not fast enough in order for us to get there. But this week we had a great push. I saw, and I'm sure that all the listeners saw as well, that the G7 has agreed to stop overseas funding of coal to limit climate change. The member states issued pledges to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, which of course is the stretch target in the Paris Agreement. And they all came forward with a shared commitment a month ahead of the meeting in Cornwall to say that international investments in unabated coal must stop now. Completely unambiguous. They will not build any more coal and they will not finance any more coal overseas. What we're seeing here is a transformative shift and it's very exciting. What do you think, guys? Girls. Sorry, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, girls. Christiana. 
So let's let's unpack that a little bit, Tom. Let's so do it. first of all, um, who are the G7 members? It is seven industrialized countries, uh, top industrialized. United States, UK, France, Japan, Germany, Italy, and Canada. Why is that announcement so important? It is important in several respects. First, I want to point out the fact that it is 1.5 degrees centigrade is the temperature that they use as a reference is absolutely groundbreaking. Because Mm. let's remember that just a few years ago, everybody was heading for two degrees or Mm -hmm. in the best of all circumstances, well below two degrees, which is what the Paris Agreement says. But if you had told me even just last year that there would be an official statement from the G7 that points at 1.5 as maximum temperature rise, I would not have believed it entirely. So 1.5 cemented into G7 statement is amazing. Mm. The second amazing thing is um, what has been done here with coal, as Tom has, um, has already told us. The fact is that most of those G7 countries had already, prior to the G7 meeting, they had already said that they were not going to finance coal. But the big holdout here was Japan. We have said on this podcast that there were, just a few months ago, three major governments that are still financing coal in uh, overseas. Korea, Japan, and China. We heard from Korea back in April that um, at the Biden Climate Summit, that they were going to stop financing coal. That left Japan and China. Now Japan, together with the other G7 countries, also agrees to stop overseas coal financing. By the end of this year, that is immediate in terms of financing terms. So the only holdout now is China. One country left that is still financing coal overseas. And let's see how long they will stay there. But a huge shift, I must say, certainly for Japan, the fact that um, that this comes as a group of countries, G7, very, very exciting. I, I was just um, talking to Marina on the Global Optimism team this morning about a, a letter that we have been drafting for now for a couple of weeks. And every time we're almost ready to send this <laughs> rather important letter, we have to pull it back and say, no, 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 now we have to update it. You know, we just updated it a few days <laughs> ago with the IEA report. This morning we said, no, 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 don't stop. Don't click it away. Don't send it. Now we have to update it with the G7. And that goes to Tom's statement, you know, about how fast things are moving. Uh, It really is quite exciting that every time we want to send an important letter, we have to stop it because there is one more big political announcement on climate. I don't know who that letter's to, but I hope it is never sent because as long as the good news keeps coming, it'll never, it'll never leave. Um, but just look, what a beautiful thing. Joined up government, you know, how crazy it was to say, you know, you're going to decarbonize within your national borders and then fund a whole bunch of coal overseas. Absolutely brilliant to see government becoming really coherent across ministries through the G7. It's a great cause for celebration. And it's interesting, just to break down the geopolitics, I was talking to some folks in, who work um, in, in foreign affairs today, and they were saying, Of course, the issue with Japan and China here is not really so much to do with coal, it's to do with exerting influence in their region, right? I mean, China and Japan have been engaged in this race to try to exert influence across Southeast Asia. And one of the ways that they've done that is they finance big infrastructure projects, which then build some kind of allegiance to their country. And that's that's been a real back and forth. And what the analysis was that I heard is that Japan would not have done this if they hadn't actually been speaking to China and were expecting movement from China on this issue at some point this year. So I can't corroborate that, but that does seem to make sense that actually there's more moving in the background that could suggest that by the end of this year, we might see the idea of overseas financing of coal basically consigned to the history books with China being the last holdout. And if anyone's wondering what is the f- foreign affairs, it's to do with the foreign ministry of the United Kingdom, which is called <laughs> International Relations in Every Other Country. I don't know. I think it's a very odd name. <laughs> So the question now, and I think we have to turn our sights to this, is um, what's interesting. So again, looking through this year and how does this all ladder up to where we're trying to get to? um, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before. We are 28 gigatons short 
of being on a 1.5 degree trajectory by 2030, right? That's a massive difference between where our emissions are heading and where they need to be for 1.5, 28 gigatons. The Chinese NDC, such as it is, maybe it'll be strengthened or not, gives us five. The US commitment gives us two. We got about one from the EU. So we're 20 gigatons short of that commitment. That's just a reality. The only way we get there is with something big on land use, complete end to methane leaks, and the end of coal, certainly across the OECD and beyond that. So this is a big step. But the question now is whether we can pivot this into a G20 commitment. Christiana, what's your political assessment of whether the G20 is ready to get rid of coal as well? Well, um, definitely the harder part <laughs> um, of the of the story here, because uh, the G20 includes some very large developing countries that will be looking over their shoulders toward the other developing countries that um, that depend on coal, either for export or for uh, or through import for their industrial activities. So very understandable that uh, that this is going to be a heavier lift. I think it's going to come down to a uh, domestic, every country on its own, decision of which is the less risky for them. Where do they get more benefit? By sticking to a um, either a product that they have been exporting or importing that keeps their wheels turning, although they all know what the damages are from that product, or whether they feel that they can actually um, diversify, uh, leapfrog into the technologies that we know. And I think it's going to be very much of an individual decision of every country. Which of those two sides represents their interest best? And I say interest, and of course, there is there you have to unpack between short term and longer term. Probably they would all agree that long term, uh, they should all transition. The big challenge for them is short term. And there I want to come back to the G7 because once, you know, we get over the excitement and the jubilation of the positive things that were announced, one thing that was not agreed to was financial support for developing countries transition. Yeah. Mm, and yeah, yeah. so that's the other part of the equation, right? As long as there is not enough support financially from governments of the industrialized world, from multilaterals, et cetera, et cetera, from private sector for to help these developing countries make the transition, it is going to be exceedingly difficult for them to be able to see a clear path toward uh, toward clean technologies. Mm. Well, we should we should move on to talk about kind of youth climate activism. But if I may, I'm going to just mention one thing that's followed on from this IEA report. And I kind of mentioned it briefly last week, but I, I just want to emphasize it. The IEA report that is still reverberating around the world was saying that new oil and gas production should cease now to keep us between uh, under one and a half degrees. And Tom, to your point about the missing gigatons, you know, the oil and gas industry, I actually have confidence that it can sequestrate those gigatons or some of them. You know, biomass carbon capture and storage or direct air capture has uh, incredible potential. Now, I know that the economics of it are very hard to fix, but I believe an industry that can go and send unbelievably complicated big machines into any country in the world and dig miles down into the Earth's crust sideways can also get some laws changed and get some uh, uh, in, in financial incentives to, to, to be able to pump down from the atmosphere. So that's my gauntlet down to the oil and gas um, exploration production industry. You're not out of a job. You're at a moment where if you reinvent yourself, you can save the world. I really want to see a, an image of you actually throwing a gauntlet down. Maybe that could be even the fourth tweet, Paul. You should make a little meme, throw a gauntlet down to the oil and gas industry. Who knows? I, I, this is what I'm doing now. Hang on. Here's the noise. Uh, Clay, can we have a, a gauntlet being thrown noise? Yeah, sure. Uh, but let's make it a scene. So Paul throws the gauntlet down at the oil and gas industry. Take one. Cue music. Okay, wide shot. We see a rider approaching over a green English Yorkshire hill in the distance. He has a magic hat on. It's Paul Dickinson. He raises his gauntlet and throws it down. The townspeople of 
Yorkshire gasp. <gasps> what will he say? Okay, and action. I put it to you, oil and gas industry. You must change and save us or slip into irrelevance. <laughs> And scene. Nice. Cut. Uh, I know you didn't ask for that, but there it is. Paul throws down the gauntlet. So, Paul, you're throwing down, like, Thanos has a gauntlet, right? Thanos's gauntlet is thrown down. You've never seen the Avengers, have you? I haven't, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thanos is bad, I think. Um, however, this segues, 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 segues well. Please may I thank very much indeed Wada5 from Australia, one of our listeners who wrote, listen to these words and weep. I decided to leave an oil and gas career due to climate change concerns and I'm studying climate change policy and renewables as part of this transition. This podcast, Outrage and Optimism, was recommended by our lecturer and I found it to be a fantastic way to keep up with the rapidly changing climate news as well as learn more about specific topics in depth. So thank you, Wada5, and thank you to your lecturer both. That's wonderful. It's being, being suggested by lecturers. That's great. That is pretty good. Can I follow with one more listener that sent us in uh, a very uh, long, beautiful message that I am sadly going to have to shorten. Uh, but this comes from Ali in Peru. And uh, Ali says, I just love listening to your interviews. They're so enlightening, challenging, funny. That's for you, Paul. And oh. interesting. That's for you, Tom. <laughs> They make me think Ali, what? and what? feel what? so what? much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Just ascribe things where they are. Your comic relief, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I am sulking. Carry on, Christian. So Ali says, I live in Peru and I'm trying to transform a 70 plus years industrial textile family business into a sustainable enterprise. It's so challenging and exhausting at times, but listening to you makes me realize there are so many others out there fighting the same struggle. So thank you very much, Ali, for, um, for that message. Yes, there are many fighting the same struggle. That's so nice. And I think that I think one of the things that it's so easy to feel in climate change, right, which is that it's, you're all on your own. You're sort of doing your bit and it feels like this big global challenge. And I think if this podcast can play some kind of role in helping people to feel the sense of community of those who are struggling with this issue, I mean, the truth is that I think we've never really worked out as humanity how to think about climate change in a manner that takes in the scale of the transformation and the scale of the possibility of humanity coming together around those issues. So if this podcast can play a role in helping people feel part of that global endeavor, that makes me really happy. Mm. Well, indeed, I'm incredibly excited that we're going to be interviewing uh, Jerome Foster II. And he is a young person. Uh, and, you know, Somebody once said, there's an old saying in activism, actually, that the best people to break the chains are those who wear them. And it is the young who are wearing those chains most uh, acutely with regard to climate change. And, you know, I, I think that, that it was, was it David Attenborough who said to us, uh, to you, that, um, that uh, younger people have clear sight. And um, I just think it's incredibly exciting to sort of think about that global possibility you described, Tom, uh, but also how it goes to the root of what we call justice. And, you know, I happen to be looking at the uh, outside of our biggest court in London, the Old Bailey, the High Court or whatever you call it, and it's a pretty serious court. And on the top outside it says in big letters, defend the children of the poor. So there you have it. That's our challenge. Hmm. Can it bring us all together? Well put. Okay, so as you say, Paul, we have an amazing young individual on the podcast this week. Uh, this was a fantastic interview that we conducted just a couple of days ago. At the age of 18, on March 29th this year, Jerome Foster was appointed as the youngest ever member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Before becoming a political advisor, he had already served as a congressional intern for US Representative John Lewis, who of course passed away recently, and we spoke about that on this podcast. He's also the founder of One Million of Us, an organization devoted to youth voting and advocacy. And at 14, he had founded an immersive technology company 
called Tau VR that built virtual reality environments around climate change, Latin American immigration to the United States, and more. Um, in 2017, he founded The Climate Reporter, an international youth-led news outlet, and he was inspired to action by a deep early connection, as you're going to hear, a deep early connection with nature, as well as a sense of desperation following years of educating himself about the climate crisis and witnessing inaction on the part of adults. He has been striking in front of the White House, often on his own, now for 58 weeks. Hold on, um, hold on, Tom. He no longer strikes in front of the White House. He's now, he's inside, now inside the, the White, White House. He's struck yeah, the White yeah. House. <laughs> he's struck, now he's inside. Um, amazing person. I mean, what a CV for an 18-year-old. And as you're going to hear... 19, he's 19. He's now 19. Okay, thank you. As you're going to hear, just incredible poise and so thoughtful and so committed. This is a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it and we'll be back afterwards with more discussion. Jerome, how delightful to have you on Outrage and Optimism. Uh, we, we will ask you at the end, this is just a fair warning, whether you're more outraged or optimistic. But in the meantime, we want to go on uh, on a little journey with you that would frankly start with who are you and where did you come from? How come your bio already reads like you are 52 with everything that you've accomplished? Four careers from, as far yeah, as we yeah. can in, see in so a good far. Way. Four yeah. careers <laughs> with, um, you know, getting the vote out among youth, a virtual reality environment for climate change, uh, a news outlet, 58 weeks of standing in front of the White House. I mean, it is just amazing. And then, of course, your very, very recent appointment to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. My, it, it reads to me or it sounds to me, Jerome, like you've been pushing back your whole life. I recently saw an interview, delightful interview that you had with Christiane Amanpour, who in my book is the best interviewer in the world. And she asked you a question there at the end, and you said, let me push back on that, Christiane. And she was <laughs> delighted that you were pushing back. Um, but it does seem like that's a leitmotif in your life, to push back. Is that so? How, who, who is Jerome, and what? How, how did you press 58 years into 18? <laughs> Thank you for all those compliments, Christiane. I, I don't know. It's My entire life has just been like trying to figure out how to, like, make an impact wherever I could. Like when, as I grew up, I had always had a deep connection with nature. I was always out and like just traveling in creeks and like taking hikes with my mom and dad. And I just understood and like had just a, like a deep like love for nature. Like it was like everything I was around me, I loved just being surrounded by it. And as I grew older, I just saw the devastation and read about it so much. Like my family is like a big reading family, a big documentary family. And through like our family, get togethers of sitting down and watching documentaries, not just about astrophysics, which was my original passion of like learning about like galaxies and distant stars. Yeah, just that, like, just that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, let me learn about my own planet. And as I learned about it, I came to this, this moment where I understood that climate change is happening. And it's not that it's going to be solved inevitably. It's not an inevitable solution because it's now been... I started when I was like five or six years old learning about this. And five years later, I was 10 thinking, why has no one done anything? Why have the adults not done anything? Why well, I've read books about this for five years and we're still talking about <laughs> the same things. I read a book about an endangered species and then I would see, well, this is the same book I read a couple years ago. And then as that naivety faded, it was kind of replaced with not outrage, not a, a mixture of optimism, but kind of just a deep sense of urgency. And just a feeling that if we don't do something, what will happen? Like that naivety faded and it was replaced with the fact that we have to actually take action because my generation is the only one that's going to actually do it. Because for so long, like adults just don't have the same perspective as my generation. We are literally growing up in this crisis and we are actually right. going to be devastated by it. And I think that is what really, it wasn't, people say I, I was like brave to go out to the White House or, or it was like, it was as courageous, but it was just out of a fire inside of me saying that if I don't do this, what will happen? So many things that come from bravery come from like these uh, courageousness. It just comes out of out of 
desperation, kind of, because we're looking at our self-protection. Yeah, desperation. I like that. <laughs> How did your family react when you, you know, became an activist at such a young age? Did they were they supportive? Did you, did they think you were wasting your time? How, what was the family reaction? No, no, my family has definitely been a support network. My mom and dad are the people that originally like got me interested in this. Like we would always sit down and 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 have family get-togethers. And I think that like, when I first started, I, I was not a traditional activist. I'm a coder and a computer programmer at heart. I started out making virtual reality environments in ninth grade about climate change and about how the environmental crisis is impacting immigration reform, racial inequality, gender inequality, and just talking about the intersectionality of it through the lens of virtual reality and having a 360 degree experience in a digital world, we're able to have empathy to another level. You're able to step in someone else's shoes. So I think they've supported me, and but they never thought that I would be a traditional activist. I don't think they would think I would be the person going out and organizing marches for 58 weeks. But Or stepping into the White House now. <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Way cool. Yeah, I definitely think that is a huge surprise for me as well. I never would have expected that myself. Um, but it's been a long journey. It's been years. Like I asked when I when we had our first meeting, like how did the nomination process work? And they were saying we went off your expertise. And I was looking back, I'm like, what expertise do I have? And I was like, oh, I had gone <laughs> to like, different places and done so much before. But I was just thinking like, I'm an 18 year old surrounded by people in their 50s and 60s who have done so much, have large bodies of work. And I'm looking back and saying, oh, I have large bodies of work as well. I've done research papers. I've done um, studying at Princeton University and Harvard University and have that that background. And it's not really talked about that much, but a lot of people just think that I climate strike for 58 weeks and then they just took me into the White House. But no, it's it's been a long journey of like studying in Iceland and going to Miami-Dade County and going to Louisiana and the fires in California and talking about and studying them and seeing how it's impacting our climate. So it's a long journey of finally, finally young people are at the table. It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're finally here. But it's also, Jer- Jerome, let, let me push back on you now since you are the master of pushing back. <laughs> it <laughs> is your um, exposure and your, your self-education, right? You have self-educated yourself on climate and on the disaster that we're facing. But I would say it's also about the recognition of your stamina because the fact is this requires a heck of a lot of stamina. We are not going to solve this, you know, between tonight and tomorrow morning. This really does require people who are just at it over and over and over again and who understand this is an emergency and at the same time, it is a long-term battle. So I think among other attributes that they recognize in you is your stamina. Would you agree with that? Have they mentioned that? Yeah, I think a lot of them have been saying that because as I as soon as I joined the group, I uh, they were saying maybe we'll take two weeks to send in our first recommendations to the White House on retrofitting the executive order from 1994. And I was like, no, we can do this within a week. We can set this up, we can set the structure up, and we need to get this done because people are counting on us. Yay. We have been elected to this seat and people are looking to us for change. And if we're gonna sit here and take weeks on weeks to actually send anything in that's a waste of our time. Like this is the most pressing crisis. So I think the stamina that I see is just like continuing to be consistent and continuing to press the envelope and continuing to say that enough is never enough. Like we have to continue to push and continue to work further. And that's, that's, that's what I always like try to do, especially within this working group now that I'm actually in the white house and able to affect change. Can I, can I just ask you a question about, I, I think what's so interesting about your story, I mean, you, as Christiana said at the beginning, you've compressed this amazing journey into this short period of time. And also just sitting here talking to you now, you clearly have made this like, you know, this role for yourself as an activist, but activists come in different stripes, right? With different forms of energy, et cetera. And yours is kind of joyful and you're, you're into stuff and you want to have a go. I wonder if you can say anything, because some of the, one thing we sometimes see is that activism can define itself in opposition, to other things, right? And in terms of what it wants. Now you've been on this interesting journey that's been accelerated where you've been demanding for something and then you've been given a seat to participate. How do you, as an activist, sort of like 
evolve from one thing where you're pushing to them being inside and still being effective because it's kind of a different role but now's the opportunity so you need to meet that and figure out what's required of you and kind of dive in and deliver what can you say about that change absolutely that's a really good question i've been trying to grapple with that over the last two weeks of our council as well and it's a difference because i've been climate striking in front of the white house to pass the climate change education act and to make sure that we pass specific provisions to make sure that communities have funding first. And now I'm actually in the seat of the table that's making sure those legislation is impacted in specific agencies and making sure that timeline is specific and targeted. Because in America, racism is very real. Hmm. And a lot of the frontline communities that need the money aren't getting it. They will figure out a loophole where they don't get the funding. And they're continually exposed to the climate crisis and not given the infrastructure needed to be able to be resilient from it. And I think that is the change now is that I'm no longer yelling. I'm now writing letters. I'm now making large documents to send to the interagency council and the rest of the Biden administration. And I think that shift is now we're not we're we're now going to be strategic in implementing and making provisions that center young people, center frontline communities, center people that are of low income and, and people of color, because for so long we have not been in the room and for so long we haven't been considered even though we are the stakeholders that are being impacted worst right now. So now it's like, we've been talking about it and let's do it. Let's actually figure out which communities need the help. Let's figure out how much funding they need. Like in Coney Island, they need about six feet of of, of seawall and they only have three. Hmm. And the investment right now is not going directly to communities. If we look at the Lower Ninth Ward in Louisiana, that community got none of the funding or very little of it compared to Upper Ninth Ward, which is predominantly people that aren't of color. And that funding was specifically for them and they never got it. So now we're going back and looking and saying that bill was insufficient. That bill was not targeted. And let's actually make some changes that will work. And we're done with the speeches. We're actually going to get some work done. Hmm. Jerome, is there a danger that uh, now that you are on the inside, as you've described and and Tom Mm -hmm. has mentioned, that, um, that you will be trapped by the establishment, by the system, and that you'll lose the fire in your belly. Is there any danger of you using losing the fire in your belly? Absolutely not. <laughs> there is there's a major fire in me because I'm not a I'm not a person who is interested in like political pondering or political punditry. I am there for the issues. And it is a fire saying that like for me this is a ne- next step. This is taking the next five steps all at once and saying like I've been yelling for years and years for this to be changed and now i have the lever to be able to change it like the fire is is kicking off because now i have more ability to make changes and not having one person say if you're climate striking you need to tailor your your demand to just one or two things now i'm in the committee that can actually work on every council our white house environmental justice advisory council um reports directly to every representative of the federal of federal agencies and directly reports to the president So we can target things from clean technologies to infrastructure and workforce development to education to urban housing and have a large purview to make changes. So it's just broadening the scope of impact now. Hmm. I I think... um... I think Christiana knew, but she just wanted to draw attention to that fantastic <laughs> fire, which is a which is a global fire. Um, you know, none of us actually live in the United States, um, and and but we spend a lot of time talking about the U.S. administration. And I want to extend to you an enormous thank you personally, uh, because like hundreds of other millions of other people around the world, I was getting my brain fried by a very eccentric politician with a bit of a Twitter habit who for four mm. years was doing just completely crazy things on climate and he's gone so thank you for getting the vote out so you know so, so the, the 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 youth vote so instrumental to the to the biden victory i've got a question for you if, if i may I, I don't personally have any children and um i've i've been always very aware of how concerned parents are about their children you know like there's all this provision and you know i want to kind of make sure you get the best education the best opportunities in life and and you know pe- people are at the most um at the most extreme, in a sense, when when they're trying to protect their children, you know, the, the, the classical thing that, that, that any kind of creature will will go at you, you know, if 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 their children are threatened, and yet this is what I just don't get at all is, you know, a whole generations appear to be 
you know, acting irresponsibly towards their children. Um, how is that disconnect in your view happening? And how can we kind of realign that so people make the connection? Absolutely. I think that specifically within the U.S., well, around the world, really, it's not the individual parent. It is that the system itself. I think you can never blame just an individual parent because they're living within the system and the system has norms and they're just operating their lives within those norms. But I think that to your point, you said like parents just want to protect their, their children and prepare them for the future, but protecting them is actually making the changes and continuing to push forward, knowing now that they have the, the power and knowing that those norms are different. And also preparing us for the future means that we have to invest in our schools differently. Like, the generation that came before, jobs were very different than now. Jobs are much more collaborative. They're much more innovative, and they're much more team oriented. They they need they demand different things from us, and I think that is fundamentally different because my generation we we knew that from the start. We knew like technology is going to be the future from a very young age. But I think for now, like when we talk about the climate crisis, people didn't understand that because last generation saw the world as linear. And my generation was born in a system that was already exponential. And we could see the mm. curve. We could look up. Mm. We were trained to look up and see the mm -hmm. future. But past generations are just looking straight forward and not seeing the trajectory of the future. And I think that's the biggest like, shift in our mindset and perspective is that the future is operating on a much larger, larger scale than people understand. And through technology and through the environment and through so many crises that have compounded on each other, our generation understands what the future holds. And I think that's what we we want from adults to see now too. So Tom wants to jump in, but Jerome, I, I want to invite you to go one level deeper on that because it is a marked difference between generations. You said your generation is trained to look into the future, to understand and to live exponentials, right? Um, yes. For you, there's no linear, there's no gradual. All of that is like so five minutes ago. So yes. you, how does that happen? How does someone in your generation just grow up, uh, pop out, and there you are, right? The living expression of exponential. How does that happen? When we think about how my generation grew up, we grew up in the aftermath of 9-11, we were in elementary school and middle school with the 2008 crisis and also with the election of President Obama. And it was a roller coaster. And at the same time, we were going onto social media. And that was a fundamental shift for my generation. We were instantly able to connect with every other person and have mm -hmm. a broader perspective on the world and have an instant and just inherent empathy as we're growing up. We are able to understand other people's perspectives, which weren't seen on TV and weren't seen on radio. They were now, we're seeing a, a woman from Bangladesh telling her story about how, how she spends her money in a month. We're seeing a story about uh, a person from um, Xinjiang who's uh, having to flee from, from massive just inequalities and, and massive human rights abuses. And we're seeing the intersectionality around the world and we aren't hyper-localized. I think with the last generation, we just were stuck in our neighborhoods. We were stuck in our own communities. And the news is only focused on us. It's only focused on this little town of London, this little town of, of New York City. And we don't look out at the rest of the world. For my generation, we inherently knew that we are one people. We inherently knew hmm. that over the next 10 years, this will become mass adoption and that things are going to change. We're gonna, we're, we, we saw that and we saw it before everyone else because we saw the grassroots. Social media is like the ground game of the entire world. We see what's happening in real time. But we also are able to develop trends because things go viral and no one expects it to. But for us, we know why it's going viral. We know because everyone is able to have that shared experience even beyond the barrier of language. So when you think about something going exponential, it is the, the ability to see what's happening now and understand everyone's experience while also seeing that the solutions are going to take an exponential investment. So if we want to actually solve this, we have to look to that solution. And if it's not being met, then we're confused. We're like, why aren't, why isn't everyone else seeing what we're seeing? Why is no one else looking to the exponential solutions and just looking at, well, one, well, y equals mx plus b, this is the slope of the curve. And they aren't looking at like the x squared of like what the future has to hold. Because with Moore's law, getting into like technical jargon, 
the technology that we're experiencing is doubling every single year. And with that, right. new technology is advancing. So we knew to always change. We knew that change is the only constant in our lives. And that's what continues to keep us pushing forward. That is an amazing answer. And I have to say, you know, as you talk about the fact that you sort of see things that go viral and you kind of know that they, they're they going to because you understand the underlying principles, I'm sort of gripped by an almost overwhelming desire to ask you to take me by the hand and explain the world to me because, you know, this stuff <laughs> to a certain degree, right? You have an instinct and an intuition and others as well. Can I just yeah. ask about the intersection of what you just said there, which is an amazing vision. You know, we are one people, everybody's connected with this moment of kind of awakening to racial inequality that we're at right now. Because as the, as what you just described is happening, where there's, there's this sense of collective, right? We either all win or we all lose in this climate issue. And, and actually that can bring us together. And there's also this kind of waking up at the moment to realize in a much broader way than has really been acknowledged or seen before, the depth of the racial inequality, the, 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 you know, what's happened throughout history, the fact that we need to face that in a different way. How are those two kind of coming together? And do you feel hopeful about where that's all leading at the moment? Absolutely. I'm feeling hopeful when it comes to environmental justice, um, internationally and nationally. But I think that when we talk about the awakening of, of, of what's happening now, it's, it's, the fight for coexistence, I see. Like a lot of the past 400, 500 years has been just a siege on coexistence and a siege on just people being able to live their lives and being being able to express their own cultures in the way that they need, they wanted to. Like people that are that were in Africa were expressing their culture the way they wanted to, and then we were enslaved, we were burned, we were targeted, we were put in chains for 400 years. And based off of that 400 year time frame. All of our institutions were created. The United Nations, the United States, the justice system, everything was built around the idea of hierarchy. It's even in the language that we talk about now, we talk about minorities and majorities. And really the world is made up of people of color. Like we are the majority around the world. When you look, there's a large plethora of culture and we've instinctually had just a hierarchy of whiteness and then everyone else. And I think that's now shifting to there's no hierarchy. It's just people want to exist and want to coexist in their own areas. They want to be able to live their lives and not be continually subjected to inferiority when they know that they aren't inferior. They know that we're all equal. And I think that's the fight now is that people are waking up to the idea that this is, this is now just a shared planet. And if we want to actually go back to a, a, a world where everyone is just able to live their lives, then we have to actually stop the violence. Yeah. Like the only weapon people are using now is violence against us. And now as we continue to to get into positions of power, we're going to continue to to be able to project that idea of a coexistence because people are just so adverse to that. And I think that's what we're going over that curve now. We're going over that hill of 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 morality and back to a a, a kind of just stability when it comes to racial injustice and racial equality. So mm-hmm. I'm hopeful, but we have a long way to go. We have a lot longer to go if we want to get to the root issues of racial injustice. Uh, Jerome, thank you, thank you for that because um, you, you know I, I also pick up on that phrase. You know, like uh, you know, so to say, your generation realizing we are one people. That's a very powerful phrase. Um, I got the hardest question for you um, that just I can possibly ever think of. So here goes, if that's okay. Oh my uh, gosh, here we go. <laughs> Um, Jer- Jerome, let me just give Jerome some advice. Jerome, you can get back at Paul by asking him to sing at the end of the episode. You don't want to do that, honestly. Although, although if you, know, you want, if you be, want any revenge for a difficult question, go it can ahead. Be very Paul. beautiful. Okay, so I'll so here's that. the question, right? I mean, I mean, you know this, but I'm just going to articulate it for for our listeners, um, and maybe I'm going to use slightly strong language. When people outside the USA look at Republican opposition to action on climate change. It can look like there's actually a lot of money supporting that view and there's a lot of money in US politics and, and, you know, many Republican politicians actually need financial support from, you know, the fossil fuel industry, you know, the the emissions heavy industries to pay for the advertisements that they need to get reelected. So, you know, in some senses, Republicans can be a bit trapped that they're not able to respond to rational argument about this because they need funding for advertisements to get themselves reelected. And what are we going to do about it? I think the premise (laughs) of that is wrong. And I'll tell you why. 
Um, we actually push back, at- push yeah, back. Here we go, Jerome, the master of pushback. I love it. Go for it, Jerome. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna push back on that a bit. Um, when we look at the U.S. government, it's structured as elected representatives. They are elected there for the sole purpose of representing their community. And when we look at the the financial structure behind electing people to to Congress or to any public position, you can just fund crowdsource from the people that put you there. If they're powerful enough to vote you in, they're powerful enough to, to get dollars and to help support you. We've seen that on the progressive side. We've seen that on the democratic side. We've seen $5 million being raised in three days um, from a progressive candidate. And I think if they just improve their, their, their policy positions, they don't have to. That when we look to corporations to decide who they're gonna fund, then they're no, we're no longer having power as people we're giving that power to corporations. And if we elect someone that feels trapped in that the only way they can win an election is to sell out like plots of land to corporations, that is not the elected representative that we want. We don't want you to represent us if you aren't going to, because you aren't representing us if you're bought and sold by Coca-Cola and by ExxonMobil and British Petroleum. We are here just to get laws passed. So I think that when we think about, well, it's reasonable that they're trapped. If you're trapped, then leave. If you're trapped, leave the the Congress. We will get someone else, we'll elect someone else there that doesn't feel trapped when they're representing their community. The only duty they have when fundraising is to their community. So look to do fundraisers, look to have community organizations, look to schools, look to churches and say, hey, I'm struggling. I need some community support to make sure that I get through this election cycle and actually be in touch with the community so that they know where their money's going and that it isn't going to fund just some ridiculous, um, just campaign. It just needs to be rooted in substance. Right now, the Republican Party is solely focused on ideology and selling the vision of a past America, while progressives and Democrats are saying, this is the future, this is what the solutions are, and these are the practical steps to get there. And that's the biggest fight. They aren't getting money because they don't have good positions. They aren't getting money because they are just spewing an ideology that is long gone and that isn't coming back in America. Uh, wow. Uh, what I would observe, uh, Jerome, that I hadn't thought of is uh, just go. <laughs> I, I can't remember. There's some famous polit- political speech uh, where somebody sort of says, you know, just go. You've been here too long, you know, and actually that's uh, that is actually exactly the right answer. And, uh, and we and- did that. Young people did that. We made up 17 percent of every vote yes. cast in the 2020 election. We made Biden. We made so many progressive leaders. So it's like, it's not out of the wheelhouse. We just have to get together and organize. Because as I said, we're one people. And as the only thing that fights a a system is a movement. And as we continue to build movements, we're seeing the power of just us. We're seeing the power of just us going on social media, making a post and creating a community. Like that's our power. The only thing that fights a system is a movement. Absolutely. Wow, Jerome, that is is such a beautiful, um, a powerful and compelling um, vision of what political representation should really be, right? It, it, it really is about democratizing um, political power and political voice and not having it be just a very select few that, uh, that influence voice, but rather being uh, the, the broader collective voice that is then heard um, on Capitol Hill. Thank you. That's a, a, a brilliant, brilliant pushback to Paul's thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Jerome, you have very clearly told us how you personally and your generation look into the future. So it is now 2030. Where is Jerome? Hmm, 2030. I would say in 2030, we would have at minimum, 75% reduction in carbon emissions. Um, and at the most aggressive, we have 100%. And we've achieved the Green New Deal mobilization. And communities are safe from the climate crisis. And we've invested where the, imbe- the money is needed. And we're able to talk about this. By 2030, I don't want to continue to be talking about this. I want this to be done, solved. And we're well on our way to solutions. And we're well on our way to investing um, into the implementation and the training of people to um, to transition to renewable energy. In 2030, I just want to go back and I want to say, we did a good job. Our movement achieved what we wanted and the fight has been won. Like on the timeline, on the timeline scale, we have six to seven years before we start reaching irreversible feedback loops. 
So if we look at 2030, we're three years past the, the target point. So we want to be done by that. We want to have already achieved the, the goalpost. So, I love that. Yeah, and then what? what? What's the next chapter for Jerome? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what that future looks like. For me, I always just try to be centered in what I'm passionate about in the moment. Like four years ago, I was solely focused on like building virtual reality and creating like emerging technologies to create empathy. And four years from now or, or 10 years from now, I don't even know. There could be so many more things. Like four years ago, I would never have thought that in ni- like in ninth grade, which is four years ago, I never would have thought that I would be in the White House by freshman year in college. I can't imagine why that's true. No, I can't imagine why that's a true statement. <laughs> It's it's wild. I, it I think is that, wild. I don't know what is next in store, but I'm always planning for the near future. Fantastic. Maybe a different room in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So, Jerome, there is a tradition on this show uh, that we uh, have to ask all of our guests um, a question, which is on a continuum between being outraged at one end all the way through to being optimistic at the other. How do you position yourself in that in that challenging stretch? Hmm. I teeter between the two, but I'm most fueled by optimism because it's generational change. We're a generation rising and we're finally having the optimism of rising to power. That's what gives me optimism every day, is just seeing my generation continue to push forward and continue to to make tangible changes. The outrage just comes from the inaction. And that motivates me as well. That motivates me to continue on this moral fight because the people that don't have moral clarity continue to outrage me. It continues to outrage me that they aren't taking real actions. So I shift back to optimism and say, what are the solutions? What can be done to stop this? And that is what really pushes me forward. I'm not really powered by anger. I'm more powered by the opportunity for a conclusion of this crisis. I think that's that's what powers me every single day to get up out of bed and organize. <laughs> Love that. There, there is, there is, a, there is a, a, a beautiful uh, kind of purity to not being fueled by anger, actually. And a lot of people in, 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 the, in, in, in this movement haven't, haven't done as much as they could do because they haven't picked up on that, that vital lesson. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Jerome, thank you so much. Really quite uh, qu- quite delightful and, uh, and a true pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you. The pleasure's all mine. So how wonderful to get the opportunity to sit down and speak to Jerome. What an incredible, thoughtful individual who's achieved so much and he clearly is going to go on to achieve even more. What did you guys leave that what did you girls leave that conversation with? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, well, girls, here's the thing. Um, he said uh, one thing that I shall never, ever forget. Uh, to change a system, you need a movement. And I was just kind of like, G-ding! this thing went through me kind of like, I love that. Because I also think, um, you, you know, observing there's a system, there was a beautiful thing where actually, um, you know, not, not blaming older people, essentially. I, I've heard him talk before about not blaming older people but actually, because they're in a system, you know, they're not parenting the young properly because they're in a system. But there is a there is a, a, a famous um, uh, acronym. I may have said it before in the podcast. I can't remember. Posiwid. Uh, but it says the purpose of a system is what it does. Our current system, the purpose of our current system is to kill us. <laughs> Right. And that's, you know, if you're wondering what the purpose of your, you know, your long term investments and your pension are, it's to kill you. Right. That's what that's what the system's currently doing. Right. So we've got to change the system. Uh, so I just have endless uh, admiration for him recognizing that it's system change, not climate change. And one million of us is an absolutely brilliant political intervention, which appears to have led in no small measure to Biden's victory, which appears to have changed the world. So thank you, Jerome. Amen to that. I was very taken by several things that he said that are definitive of his generation. And I was very taken because I've really been asking myself, are they equally definitive of my generation? And my answer to myself is definitely no. So let me point out a couple of things. 
he identified in our interview that his generation recognizes exponential change and that they see the curve as being a natural thing. That is not what we were trained, right? I don't know if, if both of you um, would agree, but certainly my generation, to which both neither of the two of you belong. But I agree with I sort you. Of do, I actually. totally agree with you, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, to the point where we think it's almost like, you know, that humans are hardwired to think about the future as a linear progression from the past. I hear that a lot from yeah. people sort of in older generations. Yeah, and, and, and we think there's no other option. We think there's no other option, whereas they don't even consider it an option. For them, it's no, pff, no way. Of course, it's exponential. That, to me, is such a marked difference between the generations. Um, and it's it's a sense of both concern, because now we're seeing that damage from climate change is exponentially growing, but it's also a huge relief because we see solutions also growing exponentially. The other thing that... Um, that he said that is related to that is how his generation that has grown up in the midst of social media, because we didn't have that when we were growing up, we've all, or still learning it, has made them so much more interconnected. I, re I remember mailing paper letters to friends in another continent and waiting, you know, weeks for an answer. And the fact that we have the social media that we have now not just means that we have completely cut away time of response, but also the boundary of response so that you put out anything onto social media and you have unlimited number of people from unlimited geographies reacting to that in one way or the other. So that immediate and very deep interconnection among um, among peers and, in fact, even across generations is something that we definitely didn't grow up with. And so I just love that he is such an articulate voice for that reality that that generation brings with it. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, he also pointed out, connected to that, I was really struck by the same things you described there, Christiana. And also he, he, you know, he recognizes that given those changes... Um, the older generation can't really parent or support in a way the younger generation through this climate crisis. Um, and that's not a failure of individuals, a failure of a system that we all kind of grew up and we're used to. So it's systemic reform that is needed from individuals who are living and who understand this kind of new world. And I thought that that, that change, his maturity was sort of expressed by both his understanding of how that exponential change happens. And also, um, you know, he indicated sometimes when he talked about just deep, long view. I mean, he talked about racial justice a lot as well. And he talked about the fact yes. that this should be viewed as a four to 500 year old fight for coexistence and a right to express individual culture and points out that all the major institutions were created when black people were enslaved and seen as inferior. And as a result, that's created baked in hierarchies that are still entrenched. I thought it was very mature that he was able to see that sort of sense of exponential change, yep. but also understand the long arc and the need to make reforms to the underlying structures to allow the exponential change to kind of be released and unlocked. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a, actually a brilliant lunch with the FT last week uh, from with Heather McGee, who's a, 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 an economist. And she's been observing how this absence of coexistence is actually diminishing the quality of life for everybody. You know, everybody loses from this stupid uh, zero sum game between any particular group of people. Um, you know, all the benefits of the internet you were just talking about, for example, uh, a, a, a social media come from our collaboration, our, our equal collaboration. But to your point, Christian, I think it's incredibly well made about um, him not seeing the future as linear and younger people not seeing it as linear. I was actually um, kind of thinking he was crazy when he said, I want to stop working on climate change in 10 years. And I kind of thought, oh, I'll be working on climate change in 20 years, you know, you know, only over in 10 years. <laughs> and then I realized I was wrong because... We, all we've got to do is change the laws. You know, if the constitutions of every country said we must protect the people from climate change, then it's done. And I can go back to flower arranging, which I had a like a sterling <laughs> career in before I got pulled into this. Uh, That's what your Twitter account is being saved for. 
But I mean, but I mean, like, what? How could things change so quickly? I mean, just think about technology. You know, it is in a very real sense the biggest political force in society. I mean, we don't think of it as a political force because it's not controlled by anyone, but it changes our lives unbelievably. But if you told me when I was, you know, uh, his age that I was going to walk around with a little device in my pocket that could access all the knowledge in human history in ten seconds, I would have thought that was out of science fiction, Star Trek. Who knew? But uh, apparently, it's true. Yeah. Amazing. How wonderful to get to speak to him. And thank God he's in that position. That's absolutely great that he's going to be supporting the government to do these things and make these changes and deal with the climate crisis, but also keep justice fundamentally embedded into all of the policies. I think it's great. I think we can expect great things from Jerome Foster in the years to come. And all the other young people that he's throwing that gauntlet, if you still have the noise, uh, Clay, the gauntlet being thrown down by these leaders, these youth leaders to, to so many others, to unleash the power in those networks to change and intervene urgently in our very fast changing world. Because I think Christiana said it for herself. I'll say it for myself. And I've seen it in you, Tom. Uh, we don't know how to make change happen that fast. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> You've seen it in me. I like it. Well, All you're right. on the cusp. I'm on the cusp. <laughs> um, okay, so anything else before we move to our musical artist of the week? Let's do. All right. So this week we have an amazing piece of music from artist activist Alfred Nomad. He's going to be performing his single Justice. You'll hear from him now, but thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoy the music. Thanks for being with us this week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. So the inspiration behind the song Justice was the sadness, frustration, and anger, I would say, of 2020, as well as the long history that we've seen of injustices against people of color, especially uh, Black people in the United States, um, in this country. And um, I actually had been feeling a lot of things um, as everything was unfolding throughout the year, uh, and I hadn't written any songs about it per se. I just got inspired to just write how I was feeling at that time, and it all came out, um, and I ended up just saying, you know, it was so urgent that I should release it as soon as, I, as, soon as possible, so I put it out, and yeah, it's basically just speaking on all the injustices that we see and that it's, you know, we're not going to settle um, you know, payouts aren't enough. Um, black boxes aren't enough. You know, we want justice at the end of the day. Something that has me optimistic, uh, even with everything going on, I'd say is that you're able to, with the spread of information and how fast we get information, I feel like we're becoming, as a populace, more educated on things that are going on. And also we have the ability to unify more and quicker um, to address these things and address certain issues and I, I love seeing that and I, and we also are able to give information of how to handle things better or you know how to make a change and how you can specifically help in a specific way and that um, definitely gives me optimism and just also just seeing the youth uh, is is way more um, accepting of each other and um, and like you said, more, just knows more than we used to when we were younger. Um, and I, th I think that they won't want to tolerate certain injustices either. And that makes me very optimistic for the future. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you've uh, decided to tune in. This song is called Justice. Yeah. Yeah. There's a roar outside my window, all I see is pain Since COVID, I know it will never be the same These masks ain't all the government is covering Helicopters hovering, cause we don't wanna hashtag another name Mad when I pick it, police see my head on the ground and wanna kick it To say racism is dead ain't realistic Not to mention it's backed by facts and statistics You ain't know, how could you miss it? George Floyd murdered, it was one horrific scene And I said that same line back in 2017 I told him to calm down, they ain't know what I mean It's the same exact thing that made MLK have a dream 50 years later still waking up to this there ain't no rope around but we still getting lynched the system ain't broke we can fix it in a day the sad reality is it was built to be this way like don't even try to get away 
That's what they said Cause the system ain't broke, we can fix it in a day The sad reality is it was built to be this way Like, even try No justice, no peace No justice, no peace No justice If the system was broke, then we could fix it in a day But the forefathers made sure they built it this way Now it might not be as blatant as the KKK But it's colder than our laws and the little things they say Like the 13th Amendment, check the context to the prison industrial complex Judges throwing down their gavels and they gauntlets So I speak truth in these sonnets Dodge hell like combat Some people still sleep like black queens and bonnets Keep egging me on, I'll make an omelet Complain about the looters that's been burning up the place But no remorse for why they started in the first place United will stand, divided will fall They take one of us, they gon' have to take us all So you can keep complaining about how we're causing a ruckus Let God judge us, now we want justice don't even try to get away They said the same thing when my family was a slave All they did was legalize it when they throw you in a cage No justice, no peace No justice, no peace No justice, no peace No justice, no peace There you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. My name's Clay. I'm the producer of this podcast. Welcome to the end of the episode. So the live performance you just heard was Justice by Alfred Nomad. Go back and listen to the lyrics again if you did not catch them the first time around. Just powerful. So Alfred, while being a talented musician and artist, is also just as talented of an activist and organizer. And recently, he launched the Everything Will Be Alright initiative alongside his record that has the same title. And the thing I want to talk to you about for a minute is proceeds from purchasing that record are going directly to provide mental health tools and resources for black creatives. So this is an opportunity for every listener on this podcast to say black lives matter and mean it. So let's do it. You can purchase the record in the show notes to support and you can donate to Alfred's initiative directly as well. I've got a link to that. So thank you, Alfred. Okay, you've heard me mention this before, but we're getting closer and closer to it. Breaking Boundaries is a documentary coming out on Netflix June 4th. Christiana has told us all it's the most important documentary ever made, and we're going to be talking about it on the podcast very soon after it comes out. We are in the process right now of actually creating that episode. So links are in the show notes below to the documentary and the trailer. Click the bell icon on Netflix so that your phone alerts you that the greatest documentary ever made is ready to watch. So seriously, go check it out. Outrage and Optimism is a Global Optimism production. Our executive producer is Sharon Johnson, and our producer is Clay Carnell. Global Optimism is Sarah Law, Katie Bradford, Lara Richardson, Marina Mancilia Germán, Sophie McDonald, Freya Newman, Sarah Thomas, Sue Reed, and John Ward. And our hosts are Christiana Figueres, Paul Dickinson, and Tom Rivikarnak. A special shout out this week to our very own Sophie McDonald, who is sadly leaving us. This is her last week with us at Global Optimism. Sophie joined us last summer as an intern initially, and this January was promoted to comms and content coordinator. So in this role, she's been orchestrating the podcast interview scheduling and coordinating with all the music artists and their teams along with the work that we've done with Together With Nature. And honestly, there's not much she hasn't done to make this garden grow. And she is truly a stubborn optimist. She's off to the fundraising team at WaterAid. So keep your eyes open because you will be seeing a lot from her. So Sophie, we're going to miss you. I know you're listening to this. Please tell that farm that you want to volunteer at that Christiana Figueres endorses you as a quote, I'm reading here, a blessing for us all, end quote. Read that straight from the email. You can print it off and hand it to him. Sophie McDonald, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to our guest this week, Jerome Foster II. There are a lot of cool people. There are a lot of cool people being talked about in this episode. So Jerome, among many things, is organizing through his foundation, One Million of Us. So be sure to give them a follow on social media, stay connected and active with them as they change the world. Links in the show notes 
Uh, one thing I included that you can check out is he was featured on a short film for Initiative 29 on Hulu. Highly recommend that you check it out, especially if you want to feel good about today and tomorrow. As always, if you love this podcast, we love you too. But we also love your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, particularly the five-star ones. But we read every single one and some we read on the podcast. So thank you for leaving us a review. And social media is where the young people are. At Global Optimism is our name and sharing the optimism in climate is our game. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, give us a follow and shoot us a message. Okay. That is the show notes. Next week, another episode in your feed. More outrage. And you can count on more optimism. Hit subscribe and we'll see you then.